As was the case in many places at this time, 1950s Evansville was a city plagued by racial division and tension. Segregated views were held in many occupations, including the legal profession, allowing this field to be exclusively dominated by whites. The lack of any African American members being admitted to the Evansville Bar Association led to the misrepresentation of blacks across Evansville. At the beginning of the 20th century, America was dominated by whites. Evansville was no different. In fact, the blacks were mainly restricted to an area known as Baptist Town, which got its name from the Liberty Baptist Church. Running from 8th and Canal Streets to Lincoln Avenue, Baptist Town was significantly poorer and less developed than the white part of town. In truth, white Evansville preferred to avoid and ignore it and its more than 3,000 inhabitants. Whites left Baptist Town to the African Americans and occupied nearly all of the most powerful positions and occupations themselves. Typical of Evansville's highest levels of society, every original member of the Bar Association was white. The organization would remain peacefully segregated for the first 10 years of its existence. But at the end of the decade, the status quo would be rocked by a battle between the Bar Association and one of Evansville's emerging giants. Ernest Tidrington was widely known as a powerful member of the local political scene. Tidrington controlled the Baptist Town voters, and it was said at the time that no election could be won without Tidrington and his 3,000-strong voting bloc. However, there were very strong suspicions that those votes were obtained through illegal measures, including vote buying and intimidation. He applied for admission to the bar for the first time in 1919, before withdrawing it due to the objections of Bar Association members over his perceived lack of moral character. Tidrington, and most of the black community, construed it as racism. However, he reapplied in 1921. Rather than permanently lose the support of Baptist Town African Americans, the Bar Association did not overtly reject him. Instead, they simply failed to respond. Tidrington took his case to open court, and Judge Phil Gold admitted him to the Bar making him the second African-American lawyer in Evansville. The first was Tidrington's partner, Rudolph O'Hara. However, the Bar Association, which was connected to the Bar, but was a separate organization, was still concerned about his character and reputation. He would never be admitted. His sometimes heavy-handed techniques in the political arena would eventually prove his end. Luther Bell, a 47-year-old pool hall operator, shot and killed Tidrington through the back window of his car in 1930. Bell had been on the opposite side of a political issue. Tidrington retaliated by having Bell's pool hall raided. Also, according to Bell, Tidrington had framed Bell for a false felony weapons charge. These charges, true or not, led to the end of Evansville's leading early African-American lawyer and political titan. Tidrington's death marked the end of significant African-American influence in the early Evansville Bar Association. Only four more black attorneys would practice in segregated Evansville, and there were none by the mid-1950s. Uh, there were no uh, Afro-Americans uh, at all that I remember practicing law in, in Evansville or in the surrounding counties. Uh, it, I actually would have been a little surprised if, you, if there had been uh, uh, an African-American lawyer in, in Evansville in the 1950s. Um, uh, the, the legal profession was, uh, throughout most of its history, um, not only all white, but all male. Evansville, while technically a northern city, was decidedly southern in its racial atmosphere. This way of life pervaded Evansville from the time of Ernest Tidrington's death through the mid-1960s. It kept whites elevated above blacks in all professions, especially in the legal arena. While there were a few African-American doctors and businessmen, there were no African-American lawyers in Evansville for roughly a quarter of a century. This forced black citizens seeking legal representation to search for a white attorney. This could occasionally be a long search, since many white attorneys would not represent African-Americans. Into this atmosphere would come a young law student who would unknowingly illustrate the reality of Evansville's racial biases. In 1956, Adolfo Birch, a young black law student from Howard University, was searching for postgraduate employment. 
Indiana Congressman Winfield K. Denton directed him towards Denton's hometown of Evansville. Birch then sent an introductory letter to Evansville attorney Robert Hayes. Dear Attorney Hayes, I am writing to you at the suggestion of Congressman W.K. Denton. Being Negro, a native Washingtonian, and a graduating senior at Howard University School of Law, I am looking for a place to practice law. It is my given belief that a professional man can do much better where the need is greater. It is with that in mind that I write you concerning practice in Evansville. More specifically, I would like to know the following. Is there a need for a Negro attorney in Evansville? There being a need, could you help me secure employment, legal or otherwise, while studying for the bar exam? There being no present need, what is your opinion towards future prospects? I would be very grateful for any consideration you might give me, and I hope for a reply as early as is convenient for you. Sincerely yours, Adolfo A. Birch, Jr. Hayes responded with a letter reflecting the attitude of his fellow citizens. Thank you for your letter of April 23, 1956, making inquiry as to the possibility and availability of opportunities for the practice of law by a Negro in Evansville, Indiana. I believe that there is a need for a Negro attorney in Evansville, since there is no one of that race practicing law, and we have better than 10,000 Negroes as citizens. At the present time, all of these people, by necessity, go to white attorneys for consultation and advice. There is some prejudice existing in Evansville, occasioned by its location, and it may be that the Negroes would continue their present practice regardless of whether or not there was a Negro lawyer available. I have inquiry of a number of lawyers in Evansville, some of whom are sympathetic to your situation, but could find no offices or employment available. If you desire, I will be pleased to attempt to find other employment for you while you are studying for the bar exam. However, you should realize that opportunities for employment are extremely limited at this time because of the lack of the availability of work. Very truly yours, Robert J. Hayes. As Birch would find out, this was far from a unique reaction. In fact, he was turned down at every opportunity he pursued, which led to a two-year stint in the Navy. Eventually, he was able to find work in Nashville, Tennessee. Finally given an opportunity to prove himself, he took advantage. Uh, well, here's the great irony of this story. Um, uh, 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 he eventually became the Chief Justice of the Tennessee Supreme Court. The Birch episode may have marked the low point in the segregation of Evansville's legal profession. In the next two decades, landmark pieces of legislation would be passed, both at the state and national levels, that decreased the opportunity gap between the races. Segregation became illegal, as did employment discrimination. Eventually, black lawyers returned to Evansville. One of them became the first to be admitted to the Bar Association. However, in another sign of the times, the identity of that person was not well recorded and has been lost to the anonymity of history. Today, there are four African-American members of the Bar Association. There are several other African-American lawyers who practice law but are not association members. While the simple percentages might suggest that African-Americans remain underrepresented, some would argue that the numbers do not tell the whole story. Uh, indeed, this is something the Evansville Bar has in recent years been better at than anybody. I mean, the Evansville Bar's diversity effort, um, given the size of the community, and is, 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 uh, is simply the best in Indiana. But I, I still believe that in the city of Evansville, Vandenberg County, there's still anti-Afro-Americans uh, and anti-Semitism that exists even in the, in, uh, in the Middle West. Any time that you have a community which I believe is about 14% black and you only have four or five attorneys who are black, that creates a concern with regard to the perception of whether or not uh, African Americans are at the table when decisions are being made and whether or not they feel that they're adequately represented so that they're having a fair opportunity to be heard and uh, have their voice heard when they uh, interact with the judicial system. Uh, so one of the great things about the Bar Association is that they have actively sought to improve that situation.